trying to whip through a number of uh, uh, issues that flow from here. You know, I, I did a piece on outside the lines on ESPN a few uh, a year and a half ago, where um, the wife of Tom McHale, who's an NFL player, she was not letting her sons play football. And I found another NFL player or two who were making the same kind of decision. And since then, we've seen a number of other NFL players, including Troy Aikman, uh, Kurt Warner, other folks come out and say, you know what? Um, <clears throat> I kind of love my son more than I love the game itself. And so you, you, you see this groundswell now of parents um, saying to themselves, maybe there's another way to build character in, in, in kids. And, and th I've got to believe this is a major problem for the NFL or any, any of these organizations that sponsor uh, football. Um, so, but, so let me kind of just ask each one of you, how critical is it that the powers that be in football convince parents that this is a game that is safe or at least safe enough for their children? Well, um, I will say in, uh, in all honesty, I, I held uh, both of my kids out uh, last year. But, uh, uh, and this year I'm holding my uh, youngest one out uh, who uh, who played one year and uh, is uh, is really not liking me right now for uh, holding me out again. Uh, but my uh, my oldest son, which is going in ninth grade, uh, I decided to to let him play uh, in high school, and uh, it took me. Uh, Took quite a bit of persuading, but uh, I do that with uh, with a lot more knowledge than I had when I was playing. And I think uh, you know the coaches and trainers and doctors that will be around there are a lot more knowledgeable about uh, the uh, you know brain trauma. And uh, I'll be uh, watching with a uh, microscope uh, every hit uh, he takes, and uh, and uh, I have uh, full authority to yank him out at any time. So, and I will. <laughs> Definitely. Um, uh, and by the way, can we get a? Do you have a microphone over there, John? I don't, but I can yell. You got a good yeah. basso profundo. He's in New York. Maybe there's a handheld that we can get to John. <laughs> We'll get to you as well. I'm sorry for the, the chairs here. Um, Jim, what do you yes. think? Is it is how critical is this issue of assuring parents that this is a game that's safe for kids? That's advancing the situation. Uh, for many years, the NFL has been in denial, and there was a saying, uh, "This is not football related." And because of some great work with uh, the New York Times certain reporters and certain medical people prove that a lot of these things are football related. So now the league is addressing it in a way that I think they should address it. And I think because of that, uh, in a couple of years, the platform will be totally different. But the denial has been very uh, hurtful to a lot of players because they did not get the proper treatment at the proper time. The coaches did not have the knowledge of not to put a young person back in a game after they have received a concussion. The whole concept of being macho man uh, is now proven to be ridiculous. So I think with the consciousness that's being developed at this particular time and the, the league willing to admit that some of these things are football related, scientifically proven that uh, I would not make a decision on my kids at this particular time. I would have to see what the outcome of this new attitude is. Gotcha. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris was in the film, of course. He's the co-founder of the Sports Legacy Institute. Uh, but the title doesn't do uh, Chris justice. He has been uh, arguably, certainly I think, the foremost advocate for football dealing with this issue, putting it on a table through his uh, through a book he wrote a few years ago, which is 
uh, you know, head games, just like this title is, uh, of, of this panel is. And uh, he is now uh, working with the NFL. Is that, is that a proper way to describe it in, in addressing this issue? No. Okay. <laughs> The, the proper way is to say they gave us an unrestricted grant two years ago of a million dollars, an unrestricted gift. Okay. But at least we're more on the same page than we were. Gotcha. Um, you know, I think the big question going forward is, you know, we, we have to agree and we have to appreciate that the football that we played for the last 50 to 100 years was far too dangerous and for anybody involved. I mean, and, and the brain bank, you know, it's not a great way to study people post-mortem to figure out how many people have this, but you know, 18 of the first 19 former NFL players we studied have it. Uh, every college football player we studied have it. We found it in high school football players as young as 17. Um, it's bad. And so what we're we, we, now that we finally have agreed that this is real, uh, we're trying to figure out, yeah, can football survive? And what we're, the way we're doing it is not unlike the cigarette industry. We're going with light cigarettes. Well, what if we cut the number of hits to the head in half and we treat the concussions and we educate and the medical care gets better? Fingers crossed, that works. But, you know, that's all you have is hope. The science isn't there to say where we've taken it or where we're going to take it will be safe enough. So what do you think? Uh, Dan Garza is uh, assistant professor uh, at Stanford School of Medicine, also the team trainer, is that right? <laughs> Physician. Physician, yeah. excuse me, physician. Oh, Sorry. I'd make more money as a trainer. <laughs> not, not a trainer. <laughs> Sorry, big slip there. Um, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, can football be saved? Uh, you have, t tell us your, your relevance to this topic. Well, there's two bits. One is that, that at Stanford, I'm their assistant director of sports medicine, so I'm in charge of the athletes at Stanford. We do a lot of research at Stanford. The kids are very amenable to it. And the other thing is that I'm the medical director for the 49ers. So I came into this, we were talking about this morning, just when this all was taking off back in six years ago. Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I have to answer it as a physician, which is there, there's, a, there's, a very, there's a cardinal rule in, in medicine between you and your physician, which is I have to inform you of the risk. And you have the right to make the decision. Uh, to Chris's point this afternoon, uh, we're not informing all of our Division I athletes of this risk. And, you know, that's the first step. And I agree with Jim. I mean, I can't answer that question yet. We're working hard to answer it. But until then, I think the best thing that we can do is let people know there is a risk. And you have to make that decision as parents. Mm -hmm. I also agree with Dr. Cantu, by the way. I don't see the point of allowing 8, 9, 10, 11-year-olds to, to have contact. Mm -hmm. I just don't see the point of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think the, I think one of the largest things is uh, changing the culture of, like uh, Mr. Brown said, of the uh, the tough man, uh, you know, you know, just keep going if you can walk, and mm -hmm. uh, you know which side to get on. You know, uh, keep going, and uh, that's kind of how it was uh, when he was playing. How it was in in the 90s, and uh, you know, nobody, no uh, coach uh, out there wants somebody to. You know, come out for a series and or a couple of downs when they need you, and you say, you know, I just got, you know, I'm seeing stars. I got to take a couple of plays off. You know, can you see my finger? Get back in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that culture of uh, just keep going no matter what the cost has uh, has got to be changed. And, it would take, uh, I think, a couple of generations uh, for that to happen. Right. Now, John, you, didn't you play football in college? I, I, went to, I went to college to try and play football, and it didn't work out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you come, at, I mean, you come at this topic as a filmmaker, as a journalist, as a former football player. Uh, I mean, do, can the culture be changed? Well, is this working now? You know, it's, there was something that I found after I shot this film, and I just want to read this for a minute because it speaks to the culture and not just the way the game is played on the field and the way that the guys should play it. This was a, a letter to the editor at Sports Illustrated, and it was in response to an article that said, uh, here, here's what it said. 
The first sentence in your subheadline from your story about the LSU Alabama game last fall reads, an instant classic it was not. I have to ask, what game were you guys watching? That was the most intense, hard-hitting, and exciting football game I've seen in a long time. True gridiron fans know that defense and collisions are what make football great. Pads crunching, bodies colliding, ground and pound. That's what we live for. Those are fans. And if that's all they appreciate, and that's what they see on Saturday and Sunday, and they don't see Monday, and they don't see Monday 20 years afterwards, how can they understand what these guys are going through? And that culture has to change as well, not just the way the coaches and the players act on the field, but the fans and the way we appreciate the game. So does anybody have any confidence that fans who have become aware of this topic will feel a little more uncomfortable cheering for that big hit on Sundays because they know there is a consequence. Does anybody have faith that's well, the let case? Well, me, let me, uh, this is going in a very interesting direction because it seems to be fairly one-sided. Uh, football, under certain conditions, is a fantastic game. Uh, I played it and I loved it and I got one concussion and wanting to be the kind of person I was, I wanted to get back in the game as soon as I could, but I couldn't remember the plays. <laughs> At halftime, one assistant coach came and stood over me and said, well, you know, so-and-so got hurt and he's back in the game, what are you gonna do? And I remember that as vividly as I remember anything about my career, it was insulting to me. But, on the other hand, the positive experiences that I've had, and I come to testify here, it really takes me back to my original statement. I've had a meeting with the commission in the last three weeks, and we did not disagree on any point. I've dealt with organizations that are doing the work that the NFL does not do, but I am uh, energized and I believe that at this particular time, as we sit here, the NFL is taking serious steps to rectify a lot of the things that they fought in the past. So I don't want to sit here and be just a basher and a complainer of the situation. I don't want to be one that will say that we should not take care of our wounded warriors. I've been a great advocate of taking care of our wounded warriors, but I do see the changing that is coming in the culture, and I think that should be uplifting to us because the game itself is a heck of a game. Yeah. Ms. Brown, let me, I think that's a great point. Let me take that a step further. My original problem with the NFL uh, was not that the game was dangerous, it's that they were, they were lying to the players in the country about what the consequences were. It's all about informed Absolutely. consent. Absolutely. And once, now that we are at informed consent, and now there's a poster in the locker room that says that this may cause early onset dementia, then it comes down to the players bargaining through the PA with the NFL about what level of safety they're comfortable with. Because we don't stop people in America from doing dangerous jobs. You know, cops, firemen, soldiers have much more dangerous jobs. We get paid far less. So the NFL doesn't have to go away. And frankly, the NFL has gone really far. I'm not sure how much further they need to or, or will go. But the question really becomes, what about people who don't have informed consent? And that's everybody under 18. And the question then becomes the premise of how many, you know, how many times should a child, you almost have to go like by, uh, to evolution, how many times should a child be hit in the head in sport? I mean, now that I don't play anymore, I realize I don't get hit in the head very often. Um, you know, and and high, the high school players would be recorded taking 2,200, 2,200 hits to the head in a year. How many people here have been hit in the head one time this year? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people. How many people here were hit in the head 25 times this year? None of you. But your children, if they played football, got hit in the head a thousand times. And it, it, we're, you know, it was interesting, last summer um, I was in Europe at an Eisenhower Fellowship trying to uh, build bridges and research and awareness on this, and I met an economist from Turkey, and we were talking about what I did, and she goes, oh, you know, we 
It's interesting. We have a word, a word for uh, that in, in Turkish, but it's for uh, people who hit their children too much in the head. Mm. They actually have a word, I'm not going to say, because I'll, I'll, I'll badge it, that says that they're actually called an idiot child from being hit in the head too much. Like, people know that's a bad idea, but here, when you dress it up, we act like it's normal. And, that, and that, that's what we have to examine. So what are some of the reform measures that um, are in place right now um, and how effective are, the, are they? I mean, you know, talk to me a little bit about the hit count. I know Pop Warner you know, recently reported about some uh, new, new measures they're taking. Uh, tell us about that. Sure. Um, you know, the, the number one thing you can do to make youth football safer is to lower the exposure. and ha Over half the exposure comes in practice. So what we've been pushing for, the NFL was actually the first to move on this. They can only have one day of hitting a week in practice. And the Ivy League said, all right, two days is the max. Pop Warner then went to three hours a few weeks ago. So no more, they went from 10 hours a week of kids colliding to three hours. That's going to dramatically reduce it. And one of the things that we, we are pushing through Sports Legacy to advance that discussion of, you know, less is more, is something called a hit count. Basically, we, now that we have sensors and helmets, we can count how many times people are hit. And we saw what happened in baseball with pitch counts. There was a little bit of evidence that said you could wear out your elbow if you throw too many times. And so Little League then adopted this program where you're actually, if you're 10 years old, you can only throw 60 times. And if you're 12, you can throw 70 times. And you're mandated three days of rest to let your elbow recover. And we sat around and said, gee, I think your brain's more important than your elbow. And so why don't we limit how many times you can hit in the head and maybe mandate rest in between hitting days? And I think that, that's, again, that's the, the fastest way to get to lower trauma. Is it, is it enough? It's still, it's still high. And then you're, then you're getting into, you have to diagnose your concussions. We miss 90% of them because children don't know to speak up. We don't have the technology to see them. Uh, kids are now having to see a doctor. There's laws in 40 states where you have to be cleared by a doctor. That didn't exist until recently. So we're trying to hit it on a number of different angles. And the question will be, is it enough? You could get to 20% of the brain trauma in football. You could. Right now, people aren't committed to that. But we might get there. And Dan, you're working on, uh, tell us about what you're working on. Um, so we, we actually use not a hit system, which is the helmet-based system um, at Stanford. We use a mouth guard, which is, in, in truth, it's, it's uh, not our own technology. It's from a company in Seattle. Our engineers kind of futz with it. And we use it in our football team. We like it because we can also use it in soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, so women's sports. For the first time, we can now study them. And one of the best things, there's a lot of great things that Chris has done, but the hit count issue is so logical. Uh, it makes so much sense. And we're, we're working hard to kind of meet his demand because if you think at it from my point or as a, as a scientist um, or fellow scientist, I don't know what constitutes a hit. Is it 15 Gs or 10 Gs? And of course, we don't want to get lost in the morass of science. But, you know, if I hit you in the thorax and your head goes like that, does that count as an impact? So we're really trying to work through that while at the same time getting our scientific heads out of the mud and saying, look, this is good stuff and this is important stuff. So that's kind of the majority of what we're doing right now. Gotcha. So I do, uh, I do think the NFL uh, took some good steps last year, and a lot of fans uh, didn't care for it. But I was, uh, uh, if I was a player, uh, still a player, I would've been very happy, uh, you know, cutting down the practice. Uh, and uh, you know, I played for Bill Parcells for two years. I love Bill Death, great coach. But he only knew how to practice one way. It was like a game, and uh, and uh, and taking uh, the kickoff, you know, uh, moving that up where most of the time it goes in the end zone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, I bet that you know saved a lot of, uh, of head trauma. What about getting rid of the three-point stance in football? You know, have have an offensive lineman start in the up position instead of their head out there getting hit. Anybody have any? What do you think about that, Jim? Never I think you're probably going to be the skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> never heard of that. <laughs> well, I'd like to pass on that one. <laughs> you it, guys have it's the there. only former line that has been brought up about my two-way career in high school and then my storied <laughs> Ivy League. They play football in the Ivy League now. Um, <laughs> career. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that I don't think that really makes a difference. You can learn how to come off as just as hard from the ground without putting your hand down. Gotcha. I mean, you, you, yeah. so that's not the solution. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so where, 
where do we think where do we think football is going? Right now, it's 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 the most popular game uh, in this country. Um, if this issue is not addressed um, in a manner that gives parents comfort and perhaps some fans that might feel a little bit guilty about <coughs> cheering on the violence on Sunday, if it's not addressed, is, is, is where is football going to be in 20 years? Is it still going to be the number one sport in the country? Well, look, we're talking about, to me, two different situations. When you're talking about your kids, to me, that's up to the parents. You know, my kids don't play football. My son is a soccer player and a little bit of golf, a little bit of basketball. Not because I told him not to play, he just chose soccer. But as a father, I would not push football on him. With our youngsters, so many parents push them as if they're going to be NFL players. And on that level, we don't need uh, parents to push them so that when they become old enough to become a pro, they're going to be great pros. So taking care of your children is one thing, but then when you get to the point of going to high school and college and you develop as a football player, there are many things, and get to the NFL, there are many things that were not being done, I must reemphasize that, that are being done now, and there are other things that can be done to make the game much safer, and one example is that if you get a concussion, they cannot send you back in the game. Well, if you get knocked out in the old days, they give you some smelling sauce and send you back in the game. And if you don't want to go back, or if you can't handle yourself, they say that you're not a man. So if you get rid of that part of it and all the, the very definite kinds of things that go against our safety, the game, I think, will change tremendously and still be an exciting game. But how do you, how do you enforce some of these, these reform measures, right? The hit count, uh, limiting practice to, you know, a third of um, practice time on the pop order level. I mean, who's going to go around and check coaches to make sure that they're actually doing this? Uh, or, or even pulling a kid out of a game who might have a concussion. I mean, are we leaving up to the doctor, the pop, or I'm sorry, the coach to what doctor determine? Pop Warner? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think uh, we'd, we're trying to empower parents to be very active here. So, I mean, the hit, what I like about the hit count is that you can pick up your, if they're wearing a headband, you can pick up your kid at practice and look at your iPhone and see how many times they're hitting the head. And if it's a number you don't like, you can go talk to the coach. And coaches now required to have training so they know that this is a problem and this is an issue. And, you know, coaches are now being sued for putting kids back in who, when they've had bad outcomes. So I think, you know, lawsuits kind of wake people up pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be education. It's going to be fear of doing the wrong things. And it's going to be asking, asking coaches to do the right things. I mean, coaches have always been out there because they care about the kids. I mean, let's be honest. They, you know, they just didn't know. We just never asked coaches to know about concussions. Yes, the, education, the education is absolutely necessary because... Anyone can proclaim themselves a coach. And when you're dealing with youngsters, every father thinks he can coach football. And every player that played the game thinks he can coach. And they have no understanding of any of the scientific things that you're talking about. Uh, they have no understanding of truly how to make it a safer sport for these youngsters. That's a totally different set of circumstances when you're talking about the safety of these kids. And you're talking about head hits and so forth and so on. I'm trying to imagine... When I watch Little League football, how many times did I see a kid get hit in the head? Not too many, because they weren't playing that kind of football. They were grabbing and pulling and rasping people down. So maybe I've been out of, <laughs> out of whack for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, uh, have you guys see a lot of head hits among youngsters? Well, actually, they put the uh, sensors and helmets of seven and eight year olds at Virginia Tech finally this year and found that they, they hit nearly as hard as college football players. The mean of a college player was 18 G's. The mean of a, an eight-year-old was 15 G's. And they got up to 70 and 80 G's. So they, they don't look like they're hitting hard, but they are, and that's partially because biomechanically, kids aren't really made out for football. When you're five years old, your head is about 90% its full size. Your mass is about 20%. So the rate, and you have this little tiny neck with no muscle to keep that head from moving. And so you, you look at the size of their, in, in, in the movie, of their, their, their helmet is wider than their hips. 
I mean, it's, 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 it looks really crazy when you look at it. And kids, when they fall, yeah. their heads are so big with that heavy helmet, yeah. they can't stop their head from hitting the ground, and that's a bad thing, They too. look like bobbleheads. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. We were watching, Five-year-olds we were, went We were them. watching the film tonight, and I was looking at it, and I really didn't see all of that, you know, to be very honest with you. I was watching the film very carefully. That was the one yeah. my team said it hit very good. <laughs> <laughs> Well. So what do we think, Dan? You're in favor of uh, no no tackle football before the age of 14, is that right? I think so. I, I mean, and, well, it's a different issue, but I, you know, we have such emphasis as everyone as we said here. Mr. Brown said, you said, on training these kids to be pros, and they probably need to be trained in technique and 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 a lot of other things. I tell you what, that's probably going to cut down on my ACL injuries as well. I mean, if these kids are taught proper motor technique, it pays off in so many ways. Um, most importantly is, is the head, but there's a lot of things that we probably need to take a look at in our youth sports and change it. Right. Yeah, oh, by the way, you know what, um, when Pop Warner announced this rule, I called uh, Nick Saban, Alabama coach, he's actually in favor of limiting contact. And I'm thinking, wow, here's the, you know, the leading football figure in the state of Alabama advocating for a fairly progressive policy. I thought that was compelling. Uh, what else? I, I assume you're in favor of uh, no tackle football under 14, like your well, you know, Dr. I, Cantu. Doc, or not? I, you know, Dr. Cantu is my mentor and co-founder of SLI, and so you know, he, he says that. And SLI is really trying to play the role of well, there are going to be kids left there, and so we got to make sure that those kids are protected as well. I mean, I think that what we're going to get to as a culture is that really we, have, you know, the research says your risk of CT is associated with how long you play, how many hits in the head you get, and so the idea of starting kids young, like if you if you start at five and you're good enough to play through the year 30 in the pros, you lost the lottery because 25 years of this, you're almost guaranteed to have this. You know, in my opinion, like we can't prove it yet, but well, I think it'll bear out that way. So start kids later because it's, it, it's a myth that you have to play football young to know the game. Football is just athleticism and you can be trained for everything else. Except, you know, except for maybe quarterbacks, who cares about them? They wear green, they wear green jerseys in practice. No one touches them. You agree with that? Um, uh, well, if you if you if you're saying that, I would be an advocate of of, of uh, tackle football for young kids. I would not care if they uh, never tackled. I mean, I think they have flag football. They have fun. They play the game. They throw the ball. They catch it. Uh, so, if we're here to discuss. Uh, you know, kids play tackle football and I'm in the wrong place because I don't know anyone that's going to insist on that, I don't think, right? No. I thought we were going to be talking gone. about the serious yeah. area of college at least and, pro, and then the pros, but... Uh, yeah, I know. think uh, yeah, the biggest point that, uh, you know, Chris has uh, helped, you know, lead the way on is, uh, you know, I didn't even know and I would venture to guess, not many people did, know what is the criteria uh, of a concussion. Until Dr. Canton, he asked me, how many concussions do you have? I said, two. You know, I was knocked out twice, where I didn't know where I was and didn't know where I'd been, didn't know where I was going. But, uh, when he explained to me, well, have you ever had this, this, and this? Oh, yeah, that happens all the time. You know, mm -hmm. then I'm like, he said, well, that's a concussion. And I said, well, I had a lot of those then. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it just, it was just something I've never brought up. Right. You know, full disclosure here, I mean, I made a decision early on. I have, a, I have kids, three kids, 15, 13, 8, boy, girl, boy. Uh, son wanted to play football, and uh, maybe it's because I've done too many of these stories, but I said no. So he's a soccer player. Of course, he gets a concussion last year. <laughs> go, soccer go, players go, get a lot of Go figure. But, but the reason I made that decision is not because of what we know about head trauma in football, but what we don't know so far. So let me ask the panel, let me ask the, especially the medical uh, folks here, what don't we know? What, are we gonna, what, are we, what don't we know about head trauma in football? And what are we going to learn in the next five years based upon all these studies that are now being done? No, you start. 
Well, there's a lot we don't know. I can't tell you the pathophysiology of, of a concussion. So the, the thought is, and most of our science is based on car accidents, and, and the idea is that if you have a rapid acceleration, deceleration, you're probably getting shear, and that shear is in the connections between neurons, the axons. And certainly if we return someone to play or activity where they're at risk before everything's been reassimilated, it's problematic. Um, much of what we're trying to learn right now is to characterize what is a risk for a concussion. So what in your personal history, what in your genome, what in your blood proteome, uh, what about the hit itself. And then if you ask me how to diagnose a concussion with 100% accuracy, I would tell you I have no idea. And that's a problem. So we have great faith and hope in uh, imaging. So as everyone looks at this and says, are we going to lose football? If you look at the last decade of research, we are miles and miles where we were 10 years ago. And in five years, my hope is that we'll have answers to parents and to athletes at all levels that they're better informed about what they're facing. Mm -hmm. Chris? I'll, I'll agree with all of that. And then I'll add, you know, one of the big things we don't know is, is you know, what is causing some people to get CTE and some not. We don't know what is sparking that disease. We do know that once it sparks, we can't stop it. We can't diagnose it in living people. We can't treat it. But you see these young people, one little spot where this tau protein is starting to form abnormally and kill brain cells. And then you look decade by decade at the brains and by the 60s, 70s, it's almost the entire medial temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, it's, it's a mess. Uh, I think one of the things that, that we're gonna start to appreciate and uh, in this world is, is, again, what is the concussion with the idea that these subconcussive hits are actually brain injuries? Because it's the idea that if I take a 100G blow to the head and suddenly I'm seeing double, that's a concussion. But I've taken lots of 99G blows to the head where I swore I was fine. Nothing was wrong with me. And the reality is those are going to, we're going to be able to prove those are actually brain injuries. We just don't have sensitive enough tests yet. When you do image people who've taken 1,000, 2,000 blows to the head and, and said they never had a clinical concussion, they still have abnormalities on imaging, they still have abnormalities on cognition. So, uh, so that idea of the subconcussive hits is, is, I think is gonna be troublesome, especially when you take this out to other sports. I think soccer is the next place where we're gonna have to decide if heading a soccer ball is actually a good idea. And the answer is it's not. <laughs> and the question is just how, how bad of an idea is it? Well, is it heading of the ball, or is it more just you know heads colliding with each other, or yeah. heads hitting the ground? It's concussions are caused. The clinical concussions are caused by heads, you know, people colliding, going for headers and falling. Mm -hmm. But the subconcussive hits, heading a soccer ball at 20, 15, 20 Gs is the same thing as that little hit in football. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's virtually indistinguishable in physics. But we don't have soccer brains to show you mm -hmm. to say this was CT because no one's looked yet. Mm -hmm. We're looking, and I bet you we'll find it. When we find it, then we'll have a discussion about whether soccer should be done. <laughs> Too late for my kid. <laughs> That's funny. Um. <laughs> is there, um, Chris, is, you showed uh, on your, when you're doing your presentation, there was a, uh, it wasn't an MRI, but I think you said it DTI. A, it was a DTI, yeah. Can, can, is that able, uh, can you tell from that? Um, well, you can't, you can't tell yet. The DTI was the fiber tracks in, in the brain, and, and the reality is no one's really uh, done enough research to be able to show in, in a DTI what is, how do you differentiate that damage from damage from Alzheimer's, from Parkinson's. Uh, we, we actually got the first ever grant from NIH on CTE research uh, last year, and now we're, we're putting 100 NFL players who are age 40 to 69 who are all symptomatic, which are a lot of them, uh, comparing them against controls, and we're hopefully going to quantify where the damage is and what distinguishes CT from other people. But I'd like to uh, turn it over to the audience here for questions. Uh, raise your hand, please uh, stand up, say your name, um, and we'll try, do, try and do this for about 10 minutes. Uh, hi, my name is Bruce Taylor. I uh, live in San Francisco, grew up in Baltimore. And uh, you mentioned football as being one of the most popular sports on TV, but one of the fastest growing sports in America right now is lacrosse. And Mr. Brown, you were an All-American at lacrosse and uh, I don't think a lot of people know that about you, so I'm wondering if you could compare the types of hits you took playing lacrosse or gave out playing lacrosse um, compared to the hits you got in football. And also, Dr. Guards, I'd be curious uh, to learn a little bit more about your research uh, from the mouth guards uh, comparing lacrosse and football. Well, thank you. Uh, there are fewer hits to the head in lacrosse 
and it's more a matter of someone slashing you across the back with their stick or across the legs with their stick, once in a while across the head with their stick. But there's a severe penalty for that, so it only occurs uh, occasionally. And I'm glad you asked about the football comparison because, you know, very seldom was I ever hit in the head. You know, I, I mean, I was, my shoulder was my weapon. Everybody was scared. And my forearm, I would hope it was that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. And so I'm not even relating to how many times a, an individual get hit in the head because I'm up here looking at the fact that if we got rid of dirty players, rid of dirty players who intensely try to hurt someone who's in a helpless position, they can deliver a blow that can be very devastating. And then if a defensive player is uh, uh, gonna try to hurt an offensive player and put his head in there first, then he's of course gonna put himself in danger. But there's no doubt about it, there are more hits in football that are more dangerous than in the course. Gotcha. Next question. Uh, sorry, I'll, just, I'll give a short answer. Second part is I'll tell you about field hockey in six months and lacrosse in nine months because we don't deploy until this year for, for those sports. Gotcha. Who, who's next? Sean Payton was suspended for this year and many people in the sports world thought that that was a very harsh consequence of what I understand to be paying players to take other players out of the game. It's hard for me to imagine that the Saints are the only team that has such a reward system and I wondered what you folks think of it. You want, you want to take that, uh, Kevin? Oh, well, uh, maybe I was uh, on a couple of teams and uh, we had uh, incentives uh, <laughs> to, uh, you know, make big plays. Uh, I, I never did uh, hear from uh, from any teammates or any coaches, you know, we need to take this guy out. Of course, I wasn't in the defensive meeting room either. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, special teams, we, you know, the players themselves uh, might get up a little pool and uh, yeah. see who can cause a fumble or on special teams or something like that. But uh, I never uh, heard anything of, of trying to take a particular player out. I, you know what, I really think, uh, and this is my opinion, doesn't count for much, but uh, as someone uh, was telling me this the other day, it brought it to my attention. I think Sean uh, got such a big penalty because the money was coming from the team and it affected the salary cap. That's, I'm telling you, that's, I think it, it, uh, it was a way to uh, uh, go get around that. Jim, you said this morning in the other panel that there were bounties, I guess, incentives when you were playing. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Absolutely. Uh, but what you were talking about is so true, you know. Players put up some change to get out of, you know, to knock another player. Uh, out of the game, not necessarily to hurt him. Uh, and you have players getting uh, accolades because they hit hard. Football, the greatest heroes are the hardest hitters. They're respected by their teammates, they're respected by the opposition. I don't hear any of that being talked about up here. But when you are a hard hitter, you are known as a warrior, and you get respect that's unbelievable. And it has nothing to do with trying to hurt anyone or getting hurt yourself. Ronnie Lott is known throughout his career as a tremendous hitter. Ray Lewis will hit you. That is the culture that we live in. So I don't want to sit up in here like a hypocrite and cry the blues about me getting hit in the head. The one time that I did and got insulted, I held that and I, I, I shared that with you. But on the other hand, I'm usually dealing with my shoulders or people trying to pull me down or whatever, whatever. And one thing I like to say is that Rosie Greer of the New York Giants, when his players were trying to do something dirty against me, he stood up and stopped them and told them that we do not 
hurt Jim. We do not play dirty against him. That is not the way the New York Giants play football. So you have a lot of things that are positive that we're really not talking about up here today, and I just don't want it to be so out of balance that the game is just thrown out the window and it becomes a medical situation because I don't think we have a cure for cancer. The tobacco companies are doing their thing, you know. It's been proven that, <laughs> you know, they lobby. So here we are. It must be noted that uh, Rosie Greer is the only NFL player in history who also sewed, right? That's so right. A well-developed, uh, <laughs> gentle side. And that might have been a reason. <laughs> yeah. right, let's try another one here. Uh, James Ehrlich, I'm a physician in, in Denver. Um, and uh, first of all, one thing, the film was wonderful and the characteristic of what you've done with real sports, uh, there, is a, there is a sign outside. You see a lot of these inspirational signs all over this ideas conference. And there's one from John Wooden that you've all heard, but it applies here, which is that sports um, do not build character, they reveal character. So I think um, what you've demonstrated certainly is, is yeah. true. Uh, I. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm working with a group of antioxidant scientists uh, who are considerably brighter than I am on a beverage that we've been able to show um, uh, uh, improves the atmosphere for susceptibility to concussions and, uh, and, um, and it makes sense, you know, that, that part of the problem is you get hit and you, it's, there's oxidative stress and inflammation. I was wondering what the scientists here uh, feel about uh, not only individual susceptibility to injury, which you've alluded to, but um, how, do we, uh, how do we assess people um, for uh, not only the physical aspects, but you might be a good linebacker, but your, your brain is not set for that type of thing. And also this idea of maybe reducing oxidative stress and whether that seems plausible. And maybe, guys, you could work through the answer pretty quickly. So I want to yeah. get one more question in. We need to get Jim to his next panel at okay. 7.30. Um, I, I think, just briefly, I, I don't know a lot about the oxidative stress issue. I think it needs to be looked at. And, and that's the key to all this research is we need to open our doors to everyone and, and look at it critically. The, right now, the only way we really have to profile for risk of concussion is probably past medical history. I, I, you know, we, we could get to genomics eventually, but I think that's probably the, the number one thing. I don't know you. Well, how, how do you say you prove that it lowered risk of concussion? Well, okay. So we, we've, we've cured concussions in lots of animals, uh, not humans yet, though. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you're right, the theory we, is something we need to explore, but unfortunately right now there's nothing that we can do to say who's more at risk or lower your risk other than not getting hit in the head. Good. Uh, one more question. I'm so thankful. Um, I live here in the Valley. I've coached football for 23 years. I've got a 13-year-old son, um, played Division Three football, and Kevin... Um, I, I'm crying as I watch your video, and I'm... Uh, well, I wasn't the only one. Uh. Well, <laughs> you're just, uh, it's a love-hate inspiration I got, I got going on right here with my 13-year-old son, coaching for 20 years. I pa passion about the game of football, and I feel a sense of, of that, no disrespect to you, that you're almost, some of the, this panel is one-sided and almost like, let's get rid of football, and I don't think that's really what you're saying, but yet we want to raise attention to it and go... Well, my question to you, Kevin, is, you know, I almost want to quit football as a coach and tell my son not to play, seeing what you're going through, because why would anybody logically risk that, yeah. right? But by the same token, so my question to you is this, you're obviously giving, you're telling your son, yes, play, because why? And, I, and it, what two or three reasons are you saying yes? And I think I know them, because that's probably the same reasons I think I'm going to tell my son to play, and knowing that you're in your situation. Yeah. That's really what I want to know. Well, my, uh, my oldest son is uh, going to the ninth grade. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, he had, you know, he's played, uh, you know, several years uh, of football, and uh, uh, he's a pretty good athlete, and it wasn't a popular uh, decision last year when I took him off his team. Uh, his coach was not happy with me. But... Uh, you know, uh, I asked him, uh, you know, we had a long talk about it, and, uh, and I said, you know, you got to be, you got to promise me you, you're you 100% honest with me about 
what goes on in practice and games. Uh, uh, if you know, if you get a hit to the head and, and so forth, and uh, and uh, decided, and he, you know, of course, begging me uh, to play uh, high school. Uh, he wants to play high school football, and he's going in ninth grade. He's like, if I don't play now, I'll be behind, and so. Uh, I kind of gave in. Uh, I said, what's the chances that he's going to play till he's 30? Uh, like I did, and, uh, and, and felt like with the uh, knowledge, uh, with the education that uh, uh, the staff, the doctors, uh, I know, uh, and myself personally, uh, that I can I can't protect him of everything, but uh, I feel like I can protect him a lot better than I was protected or, uh, or I protected myself. Right. We're going to wrap it up here, but one, one last thought though. You raise a good point. I mean, I, I do hope this panel didn't come off as too anti-football. I think probably everyone on here, I mean, I grew up on the 1972 Miami Dolphins, the perfect Dolphins. Loved football, you know, the ball falling through. It was my sport as a kid as well. I think everybody here is interested in uh, making it um, a game that is sustainable over time. How do you get there? Um, and, you know, Chris, he's dedicated his life to it. Uh, Dan's engaged in this. John, uh, Kevin has stepped out on it. So. Yeah. The, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the independence, the confidence, all that kind of stuff. And I hope we remind for that. You know, if I was to do something different, if, if I was to join some kind of group, the group I, I did not allow my son to play football yeah. until he was 13 years old. Okay, for what it's worth. I, was against, and I, I am against football decision. until they're 13 years old. Why? I don't know. I just chose middle school. I felt middle school is safe enough. I don't have any statistical data. But as an eighth grader, 1980, I played flag football. I did not have gear. And I wish if I was a senator or someone, I would make football only be flag football until they're in high school. That would be something that would be a great yes, nationwide. Yes. Because there's no reason these kids to put on helmets and gear until they're 13 or 14 years old. And that's so that's what I would do differently if I had a vote to change the football arena. I wouldn't get rid of football because I think there's a lot of good. We all know the risk. We don't know the statistical risks per se. And we should be informed of those risks. But if it was my vote, I would make football flag football until they're in high school. Great. Yeah, I'll talk to Dr. McGee. Yeah. Don't, don't look at this as anti-football. This is really more pro... No, no, it's, oh, I'm just saying it's, it's not anti-football. It's pro-children. All right? Exactly. Football doesn't have feelings. All right? So I want to thank everyone for their questions. I want to thank the panel. And a, a special thanks to Kevin and to John. Yeah.